Okay, so now I would like to introduce Mr. Patterson. Um, he is the co-founder of Vital Smart and an innovator in corporate training and organizational performance. Uh, he's the co-author of three uh, New York Times bestsellers, The Influencer, The Power to Change Anything, Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High, and Crucial Confrontations, Tools for Resolving Broken Promises, Violated Expectations and Bad Behavior. His award-winning training programs of the same titles have been used successfully by more than 300 of the Fortune 500 companies. Additionally, products resulting from his work have taught more than 2 million people worldwide and have been translated into more than 20 languages. <coughs> Kerry began his research into the challenges of developing and maintaining healthy organizations during his doctoral, doctoral work at Stanford University. He taught at Brigham Young University. I think that's about enough. Okay. <laughs> 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 I had lunch today at a Chinese restaurant and I opened up the fortune cookie and it said you will soon meet a lifelong kindred spirit. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Only got a few hours left, Terry. Just... I don't think your bike is on. It's not on. You told me to take it off. You can wear it All right. Work now. All right. Since you can't hear me, I'll do things less important. Are you working on it? Am I counting on it coming into? Okay, I'm counting on you. Do you want to use that? Is it ready? Like yet? Oh, say. Do this will work. Okay. Can you hear? Okay. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. It's like one of those lounge guys. You know? <laughs> Never had one of those before. March 30th. Who has a birthday close to March 30th? Okay, what is it? Anyone? Shout them out. Closest. Anyone closer? April 1st. Oh, okay. 29th. <laughs> okay, 29th is closer. You get to have this. Come and get it. Um, May the 5th. Anyone? 15th. May 6th. May 5th. That's yours. <laughs> now, these, these may be let. We, can you really hear this? I can't hear this. This is actually working? Well, yeah, if I go like that. <laughs> um, this is, my partners and I actually sat down and told stories that are not in the book as something you can listen in the car. Does anyone ever do that? Yeah. Okay, all right, then I'll pass them out. Um, let's see, November the 15th. Mine's the 17th. 16th. 16th. Okay, okay, here's 16th. Where's 14th? Hey, that was pretty good. Those are family birthdays and stuff. Okay. Okay, testing. So it goes. Okay, there we go. Better. We're cool. Okay. That was a fun ten minutes. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> My name is Kerry Patterson. I'm a researcher, professor, author, consultant, that's getting too loud, uh, and, and et cetera. I'm married with four children, too experimental to control. <laughs> <laughs> One of the control children is actually attending UVU. You can see him. He's the kid who gets released out of the Skinner box at 8 o'clock every morning in the parking lot. Um, I'll be speaking for one hour, supposedly 45-minute presentation with a 15-minute Q&A. I may go 50 minutes and 10. We'll see. Uh, and I'm here to today to talk about Influencer. I spent the last 30 years of my life as a consultant, researcher, scholar, traveling around the world and designing things to change the world. Uh, and sometimes successful and sometimes not. I, for example, was part of a huge team that tried to save American manufacturing at Ford Motor. Okay, so not everything worked out. <laughs> if you want to know what happened, I can tell you in detail later. Um, and I've been writing about it in some, with some intensity for the past 10 years. Um, I, uh, today I'm talking about someone have influencer. You hold that up. That's the book. It's one of the five thousand. I'm assuming. If you want to get people to go to the library, don't tell them you have five thousand books. Tell them you have two. 
5,000, like, who's going there, man? They got like 5,000 books, man. How motivating can that be? All right. <laughs> it's, it's probably true. <laughs> now, if, let's start with the challenge. I'm going to look at an influence challenge that many of you might kind of face. This is a scenario with Michael Birkeland. Michael Birkeland's an actor from here locally. Uh, we put him in this scenario where he's a junior sales associate. His job is to go along with his boss, zip up his mouth, and watch how to, how to complete a sale. It's a high-end, you know, computer kind of dude. Uh, and watch what Michael does. And the question would be, what would you do to change this guy? Because he's going to need some changing. <laughs> about a month ago, we decided, well, about six months ago, we decided that we wanted to go onto YouTube, see if we could produce some viral material that would take people to our web website that deals with crucial conversations, which is a subset of an influence set of skills. And so uh, I, I worked with Michael on several other uh, acting gigs. Uh, I'm the producer, director, writer of all this stuff. And I saw him doing that little thing, and I thought, wouldn't that be cool if we created a, a scenario here? Uh, the the way, I'm put, way I'm working it into today's discussion on influence would be, you're going to have to work with people like that someday, and you're going to have to figure out what are you going to say and how you're going to say it. And that's one subset of influence. But let me show you how, what we mean by the broader subset. Uh, influencer, um, I have, uh, this is uh, my favorite David Sedaris quote. I haven't got the slightest idea how to change people, but I keep a long list of prospective candidates just in case I should ever figure it out. <laughs> you know, that's, I think, how most of us are. And uh, I want to see that change. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. Within each of us lies one of the most important of human capabilities, the power to influence change in ourselves, our community, even our world. But often we're left frustrated, even angry, when our influence efforts fall short. I'm ready to do a little hands-on influence, if you know what I mean. I'm not trying to change the world. All I want is to get these jerks to follow safety standards. Hey! Put your goggles back on! So ask yourself, if you knew how, what would you influence? We've been fighting pitched battles between union and management for as long as this factory's been here. The way things are, it doesn't benefit any of us, but it's the same darn thing year in and year out. I have a son that has tried to quit drugs about a dozen times and has failed just about as many times. We have the best Six Sigma consultant money can buy. We just don't have buy-in from our people. And unless that changes, this is just going to be another program that doesn't live up to its potential. I know I should stop smoking, eat better, get some exercise. Actually avoid going to the doctors. I'm just sick of hearing about it. But the truth is I want to change. I don't know how to do it all. It seems so overwhelming. We infect hundreds of people every year because we just can't get everybody to consistently wash their hair. After 50 years of trying, what's left to do? I know we can do a better job of taking care of each other. I suppose if I could influence anything, it would be that. But where do I start? I'm only one person. We knew for three years we had to reduce costs or lose our jobs. 
Harley couldn't get people on board, even with the threat of outsourcing. It's still a mystery to me. If you feel overwhelmed, ill-prepared, misaligned, or just generally out of options, you're not alone. But that begs the question, what can we do about it? Uh, what's the most dangerous plot of land in Utah County right now? And it's not Geneva, that's Geneva Steel. It's down the hill, up the hill. How does that work? Up the hill to the mall, turn right, go down the hill. <laughs> what's the most dangerous part in any community? The hospital. The likelihood of catching a disease and dying is higher there than any other place. Nosocomial infections or hospital-acquired infections are raging in the country. Now we have the... Flu, Did you, know, you notice I didn't, when you guys were doing that clapping, I didn't do it, I didn't want to catch the flu from myself. <laughs> the most dangerous place is that hospital. How would you change that? We're working with Johns Hopkins and four or five other hospitals to do that because we have been studying worldwide what does it take to bring about systematic and lasting change and make it work and stick. Well, that's, of course, what lasting is. The most important capacity you possess is the ability to influence behavior. For instance, rapidly improve productivity, move quality from the bottom quartile to the top. The Center for the Advancement of Leadership, these are the kind of things those leaders are doing, right? You can talk about it in the abstract, when you get your job, you're going to get an assignment that says, fix this. Our safety record sucks, people are dying. Engage business leaders in rebuilding an economy, Re uh, react intelligently and quickly to financial setbacks. We did a survey recently where we asked people, during the downturn, what's the likelihood that your executive team and other leaders will sit down and have a reasoned and effective discussion on what needs to happen next? Or will it be politically and, political and stupid? 85% said it'll be political and stupid. That they'll overreact, they'll lay off by 10% you know, across the board when one department should be expanding by three or shrinking because people don't have faith in our ability to do the right thing and do it well. Dramatically improve school test scores, reduce medical errors. I just talked about that. We'll, we'll go into this in some detail here. Here's the big point. The most important capacity you possess is the ability to influence behavior, that of yourself and of others. And yet few of us have any systematic way of even thinking about this fundamental challenge. Before you leave this institution, you should have a model or a theory of human behavior selection. Why do people do what they do? Do not read those models as if they're equal. Maslow's need hierarchy has been discredited as a simplistic overstatement some 30 years ago, and yet people continue to teach it as if it were somehow meaningful and truthful. Find the contemporary model of human behavior selection and know how to bring it to work when you become a leader someday. So we went out and did a worldwide search, so sort of saying, you know, what are articles out there? We found 17,000 of them. We had a whole team going over them. The average amount of change reported in those articles was zero. We did find leaders and scholars who had succeeded, whether it failed, and they had data to prove it, and that's where we began to focus our attention. I myself flew to Tanzania. I've been all over the world looking at people who bring up, who've done everything from sol solve the guinea worm. The Carter Center, for the first time in the history of the Earth, is eradicating a disease not through inoculation, because it can't be solved that way, but by getting people, 40 million people, to, be to change their behavior. This is the first time anything like that's ever happened before. We study these people. We use these methods to influence about 50 other organizations of which we have been ragingly successful in about 40 of those attempts. <laughs> For example, Don Berwick, speaking of our influence heroes, he helped save 122,000 lives in US hospitals from medical mistakes, nosocomial infections, by influencing the behavior of healthcare workers. One day he just sat down and said, you know what, I'm fed up. People are dying, I'm gonna fix it. His goal for this next year is a million people. One person sat down and said, I'm going to save a million lives because he knew how to do it. Okay, we want <laughs> Rosanna Pathiacorn. Okay, everybody. Rosanna Pathiacorn. Okay, everyone. <laughs> Saved over five million lives from AIDS <laughs> by influencing the behavior in Thailand. One guy who was the Minister of Health goes to the president and says, You know what? We're, we're, you know, we're going to all, geez, geez, I'm almost all of us are going to die of AIDS in this country. You know, prostitution is frequented by like 85% of the men, and that's how, they, that's how they get it. And they all said, who cares? And they said, but your army's gonna be so weak that you can't fight anybody, and the president said, I care. And then in this book, we'll, we outline in detail the steps that he took to not only turn that around, but in, in the process, he is credited by the World Health Organization for saving five million people, one person. 
Mike Miller is our typical executive he worked with. He improved productivity by 93%, eliminated defects and missed, uh, missed release states, improved morale, and saved $20 million in cost at Sprint by influencing the behavior of 1,700 uh, IT professionals. This is an example of one of the 40 organizations we've worked with. We do experimental and control groups before and after. We do real tests. We look for real research, not people who appear on the internet and say, buy my pill or whatever it is, real hands-on practitioners and scholars who actually do research. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a true heroine. This is Mimi Selbert. If you don't know her, you should meet her. If you can't meet her, you should go to San Francisco. You'll see here in this picture here, Mimi Selbert has helped over 14,000 criminals, lifetime drug addicts, and gang members change their behavior forever. She has a 91% cure rate of people who have 17, on average 17 felony convictions. 91% of those people within two to three years will be, re, will be put back into the country <laughs> as productive citizens. We see in the middle of Delancey Street, it's a restaurant where if you go there, if you, come off, if you come off the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, hang a right and you're going down the Embarcadero on your way to the wharf. You with me? Have you been there? On the left-hand side of the street, you'll see Delancey. It's a wonderful little restaurant and the person waiting on you is likely to, will have been one of those career criminals. And they will serve you a delightful meal and you can say, what, did, what are you in for? And they'll say things like, murder. <laughs> and they say, can you tell me your story? And they will. Now, everybody should have a chance to meet this person what do you think the cure rate for people who have alcoholism, drug addiction, 17 felony conviction is in the rest of the world? 5% if we're lucky, 3%, 6%. 12-step uh, so, uh, programs are 6 or 7%. 91%. These were the people we wanted to learn and clone. Remember when Jaime Escalante, the guy that went, figured out how to teach, how to teach uh, calculus in the inner city? And what was it called, stand and deliver? Yeah, okay, stand there. That's Jaime. I was going to fly to Bolivia to talk to him to find out how he could do it. And he wouldn't do the interview because he was so discouraged because he had figured it out and no one asked him how he did it. In fact, they said he was this true believing hard worker that could never be cloned and fired him and got rid of him. Rather than cloning the world's expert, we can have everyone, just about anyone alive, learn calculus if we followed his methods by watching his best practices and we just sent him back to Bolivia with his tail between his legs. Okay. Turn to the person next to you and answer the following question. The chief of staff in one hospital does the grand rounds every day, visiting many patients with medical students. He almost never washes his hands. Discuss it for one minute. Why don't they do that? Go. Okay. 20 seconds. Okay, why? You were talking, why? Um, we figured because he thought he, he was too busy and he didn't need to. Because he ah, he thought he was too busy and he probably is really busy and he didn't need to and why didn't he need to? He'll be wearing gloves. You know. And so you take that glove hand and you, and you put it into the infect, inf infected pustules in this man's body. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> they're just pustules. I'm not sure they're infected. Anyway. And, and, then, and then you go and you, and you pat down the person you know, in the next room. Does those, those, those gloves help? No. The physician. <laughs> Physicians are more likely to wash in or out of a room. Out. <laughs> they just touch the disease so they're going to have to clean it for themselves. Washing in is to protect the patient. Okay, so, you know, they, you know, they don't, and they figure they're clean. Anyone else? Quickly. You. Laziness. Laziness. Okay. Okay, what else? Convenience. Convenience. Yeah. Okay, the, the issue here is, ladies and gentlemen, there are multiple forces in play here. I asked you sort of a trick question. I said, what was it? You came up with an answer, and the answer is, there's all kinds of things. And at the end here, I'll show you a little experiment we conducted. We had to change four or five things to get them to change that behavior. Some affecting motive, some affecting ability, some affecting both. We live in a quick fix world looking for silver bullet answers to complex influence problems. I set that up as a bullet. Give me the silver bullet. But there is not one cause. There's a conspiracy of causes. 
We all know that conspiracy guy. <laughs> if you want to influence a persistent problem, you'll need to draw on many sources of influence. There are, we are outnumbered by all the sources that the world has organized against us and our current bad behaviors, and we are blind to most of them. What is the impl- impact of my hanging around overweight people? Don't get too personal here. It changes my expectations about what's average. In a, recent, in a recent report from the United Kingdom, they say there's over 10 million people who are actually morbidly obese and who no longer see themselves so because all their friends are the same way. That's an influence of social forces around you, and you probably wouldn't see that. You go into a restaurant to spend, 50, say, a half an hour with your kids, like a McDonald's or someplace. You're all too young. You were those kids. But imagine that you do someday and you walk into that place. How are those chairs designed, you know? Hard. Why? They want you in and out so they can have turned over and they have people full time sitting around designing things that are uncomfortable. There's a staff of people with PhDs in design and whatnot working on changing your behavior. You don't even know what's going on. You just know that you want to get out of that place. I have other reasons I want to get out, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> the people designing things all the time. The world is perfectly organized to create the existing behavior and it's a conspiracy. So we've created a model here that says let's take a look at six different sources that act upon us so that we can become uh, aware of what's around us, not blind to those forces. And I'll quickly cover these here. <laughs> you see the columns here, we have motivation. Do I want to do this thing? Am I, be, am I being propelled to do this thing? Ability, can I do this? Big difference. So why didn't the doctor do it? I think it's motive or ability. <laughs> he does interesting motives. Clearly, if they were more motivated, they could, do, they could wash their hands. If you held a gun to their head and walked around, they'd be washing their hands all the time, right? You washing your hands. Um, ability may be difficult, hard to get to, noxious, some combination. And for every thing that you can do to make it easier, then you can drop off, drop off on what? Motive. As you enable behavior and make it easier, then the need for motive goes down. If you can't change the motive, then you have to crank up the, uh, uh, the ability, you have to crank up the motive. Now, we look at it in three different domains, personal, do I like it? Can I do it? Social, are other human beings encouraging me? Are others enabling me? And then structural, pull people out of the formula and say, things. The physical world around me, does it, does it motivate me? This, by the way, in organizations is pay, uh, rewards, uh, days off, things like that. And finally, are there physical features around me that enable or disable the performance? These are three different literatures, psychology, social psychology, and organizational theory. You see that? Psychology, personal, social, social psychology, uh, sources five and six down here. And so in the book, you'll find all kinds of things about each of those sources. If you only walked away with one thing today, it would be we're blind to a lot of the sources of influence. We would do better if we knew more about them. And they, co- they come around this in, in six, they come in six different packages. So let's take an example. I should eat about 2,000 calories a day. Yesterday, I ate 5,286. See, I have a metabolism problem, don't I? I don't burn 6,000 calories a day. That's a joke. <laughs> I was like, silence. What the, what's the this guy? <laughs> why, would, why would I eat 5,000 to Let's look at one source and how to change it. Source one, personal motive. The influence of the pleasure or pain of the behavior itself. This is the thing we most look to. Do I enjoy this or do I not enjoy this? It's, it, when we look at other people, we, that's almost all we look at. They must have liked doing it, even if they weren't able to do it. So this is our first session we look at. So the problem, many things we should be doing are boring, frightening, uncomfortable, or even painful. Similarly, many wrong behaviors feel pretty good for a while. You know what? If you want to work with a drug addict, if you're going to work with a drug addict, if you you can't talk with them face-to-face as their counselor about how much pleasure they get from drugs, they discount you. Because in the short term, it does bring them pleasure. And you better know that and get it because that's what you're asking them to give up. So for a while, it brings them pleasure. (laughs) I like food. I don't like feeling hungry or going without it. How can I actually enjoy eating healthy when I have to eat so much less? So I'm going to quickly say that, you know, (laughs) that's a couple of things you can do. You have to connect your long-term values. When the short-term behavior is something that's punitive and you don't like, then you have to say, what does this mean over the long run? You know, what does it mean about who I want to be? Consider a Michael Bertoli. It's interviewed him two days ago. Put a camera on him. And in a month, you can go to our website under our new book called Change Anything, and you can find this guy. 
he's pretty much like you people. Was in school, doing well, kind of smart. Started drinking, I'm not sure if that part's the same as you guys. Started drinking too much, became an alcoholic, a drug addict. Broke into the liquor store, stole money, lost his family, his children, and everything he owned down to his last CD and was sent to jail in Arizona. So how does he, how does he fix himself? Well, there's lots of things he has to do, but to, yesterday he says, says to me, I have to constantly remind myself of the long-term implications of my short-term satisfactions. So I see, I see a couple of people, three or four people around a piano, piano bar or whatever, drinking cocktails. And what is that teaching you? That if you go to that bar and drink a few cocktails, you have fun with friends. He says, I have to be able to say, that won't happen to me. I never drink for social reasons. I, I, I drink only to alter my, my, my mood. I will have one drink followed by another, then it goes to liquor, and then it goes to a binge, and then back in jail. That's the story there. He has to constantly link and bring forward the long-term consequences of his existing short-term behavior. When he does that, as he does that, that behavior becomes more, more satisfying to him. How many of you have taken satisfaction out of a job that was dirty, filthy, and other people, other people hated? Why did you take satisfaction? Um, probably just because of the way it made me feel after my physically. Yeah, you felt good about yourself. You said, I put in a hard, hard day's effort. You can find pleasure in things that aren't in, inherently or intrinsic. It's not like it's you know, firing off your, the, the pleasure centers in your brain but you connect to the vision of who you are, who you want to be, and what you care about. Okay, that's a very quick one. We'll, there's, we have like 80 pages on that. <laughs> Second one is personal ability. The influence of skill on behavior. Many idle behaviors are far more physically or emotionally challenging than we realize. So we grossly underinvest in building skills. Let's take a look at a problem that people always attribute to well and never to skill, and it has to do with what? We have, say, what do we call it? Self-discipline or delay of gratification. If they could just suck it up, what's wrong with them? They don't have enough character. They don't have strength of character. It's a genetic thing. You were born with it. What's wrong with you? It's strength of character. So we, we replicated the marshmallow study that Walter Michel did uh, in research to demonstrate that it's not that at all. The difference between those who can delay gratification and those don't almost always is a function not of character or genetics, but of what? Skill. Here's how. I love marshmallows. But then, who doesn't? I don't know what I love more. How, can, I, how can we bring the Delancey lady here? She won't come. That dissolves on contact with my tongue. We've been there four times since she's she scheduled and shined us off the roof. The we went there with Bandura, we drove Bandura up the 89 year old, and she shined him on. Ha, ha, ha. 
How important was this research, do you think? Not this particular piece, but Walter Michel and Bandura's research. This is groundbreaking. You understand, this, this goes to the fundamental nature of humanity. It says you're not necessarily born with a propensity that you can't overcome. You don't come characterless. It's not wired into your DNA. Some of you have been learned through a variety of met methods how to delay gratification through distraction and delay. And those who, who are taught it do much better in life, and we are able to replicate it here. And so it turns out source two, which is personal skill, becomes a big player. Um, let's take a look at how deliberate, it's, and it's done often through deliberate practice. Uh, the new lit literature that you ought to be aware of is, is that you know, having a teacher say, you know, read a book and then go read a book and then talk about it isn't nearly as good as having what's called deliberate practice, where a coach what breaks the task into small parts, observes you enacting them, and gives you feedback in the moment. Anything short of that, if you, kids, if you have kids who go to piano and all those lessons and they just kind of crank away and they give them a few pieces of advice, they are missing the boat. Deliberate practice is what it's all about. Let me show you what that means. You are about to learn a powerful training technique used by world-class performers called deliberate practice. The steps of deliberate practice are practice, where the skill in small parts, get feedback from a coach, prepare for setbacks. Now, Let me give a speech, you have to cherry pick all your stuff. We could show you Olympic athletes in their prime, masters of intellectual competition, even world famous ball players. We could show you these people. Let's do it. But instead, let's apply deliberate practice to a, well, more extreme setting. Three, two, one. Consider these trained athletes engaged in a heated competition. And while you may not find these competitors on any cereal boxes, their sport is sanctioned, and you can watch it on TV. Meet Don Lerman, a veteran of a sport that grew from the backfield to country fairs to today's big stage, competitive eating, and among Don's accomplishments, the highly coveted record for butter consumption. This is the reading butter. This is the coveted butter drum. Seven sticks of butter. And he was the first to cross train from one food to another. You'll notice these gastric gladiators aren't necessarily huge folks with gigantic stomachs. In fact, the top competitors tend to be average size and weight. Some are even small in stature. 
You don't have to be a big in fact to win these contests. Internally, your stomach is the same size, whether you're 150 pounds or 500 pounds. The muscle is the size of, let's say, a bed bite. So when it comes to eating contests, having a bigger bagpipe isn't nearly as important as knowing how to play it. Things you gotta work on in competitive eating is three things. Speed, capacity, and technique. You give somebody an, an hour to eat a holiday dinner or a buffet, they'll really eat a lot. But in the short time frame of these contests, two minutes, five minutes, the body can only process so much food so fast. And technique can win you a contest. As is true with most skills, competitive eating is more about technique than genetics. It's like a minute and something seconds. And if you don't follow the right technique, not only might you lose the competition, but pay in other ways. When you're eating hot dogs or any type of meat, you gotta get used to the grease. There's something when the proteins mix with your sweat or something, it's called the heat sweat. It'll get you nauseous, your legs will turn, palatic acid, and you'll get dizzy, you'll get groggy up there, and you're gonna lose a contest. You gotta get used to that heavy grease. You don't wanna get the meat sweats. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing techniques are important, but practicing the right ones, the vital behaviors, are the key to real success. So how does one go about learning new vital behaviors? Would you follow the same strategies used by other competitors, such as world-class musicians, skaters, and chess players? According to Don, the answer is yes. In fact, he knows and applies each of the techniques of a new and growing field known as deliberate practice. Listen in as Don teaches us the methods of deliberate practice. Well, when I train for an event, I start at least two months in advance. At least two months, like a an example for the hot dogs. Every day I'll put down five hot dogs with my timer. And at the end of the week, I'll put down 20 and see what I can do. When I know I got 20, I know I'm going to be in the, in the zone. When someone told me, go in into the matzo ball, cut them up in quarters. Everybody's going to think about an album. Try cutting up in quarters. With hamburgers, you want to shred their hamburgers. Eat the roll separate. <laughs> well, the way I know I'm on track with my training, uh, me and a couple of our competitive leaders will get together at my house or their house, and we'll have a hot dog run together, and we'll see what we can do. I've coached uh, friends that were another contest that I won in. I gave them the pointers. I set the timer. I uh, watch what they were doing wrong. In competitive eating, there's a term you hit the wall. In other words, you just can't go on anymore. The nauseousness is getting to you. You pray for them to end the contest. You gotta just focus on the food in front of you and your time, and that's it. So Don teaches us what Dr. Anders Erickson of Florida State University has been researching for years. If you want to learn a new vital behavior and maybe become an elite performer, don't worry about genetics. Focus on your training methods. Whether you're looking to become an expert in your sport or needing to master communication and confrontation skills, use the techniques of deliberate practice. Otherwise, you might end up pulling a ligament, ending up in a heated argument, or possibly worst of all, you get to meet sweats. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you said you get to meet sweats, I had the script written already. You know, <laughs> good to see him ending with that. In this particular one, we're, we moved to the, of our six sources, our second source, which is individual ability, and we suggested there's a whole new growing literature called deliberate practice. For those of you who watch ice skating, for example, figure skating. Uh, people who don't do particularly well talk to their friends during practice. Uh, people who are club skaters practice what they already know. And people who become Olympic skaters do what? They practice what they don't know and they do it with a coach who gives them feedback immediately so they can make those corrections. So that's just another literature. All right, let's move to one more and then I'll wrap it up here. Uh, you can help protect our natural resources by using, this is, a, this is an influence source they use in hotels. You may have been in a hotel and you see they're trying to get you to to reuse your towels. Uh, this says, uh, helps us, oh, this says this, the sentence here, you wanna save, save energy, so please reuse. That's method number one. They have a little thing explaining the consequences of the behavior. Source two is most of our valued guests in this room have helped us protect our natural resources by using their towels more than once. Will you join them? So it's social comparisons, the second one. We actually conducted this research. And then you wanna save $2, simply reuse your towels and we'll deduct $2 from your daily room fee. So, that was financial rewards. Which of these three had the biggest effect by an order of like four to one? Social comparison. Yeah. Yep, social comparison. Yeah, for those of you who you know, have heard about the idea of peer pressure when you're a kid or whatnot, 
it never stops. It doesn't go away. You just have different peers, just older ones. So sources three and four look at you know, how do other people either motivate or enable me? The influence of other people through modeling, through praise, through helping, and other, other enabling techniques. And in the, in the book, we go on and explain in some detail some steps that you can take by, you know, to make use of them. Uh, when we do a change pro pro project, for, for example, we go and identify the um, opinion leaders. You ask people, who are the people who you most respect in this organization? They write down seven or eight names. You pop it into a computer, and you, and you print it out, and you find out some are mentioned once. They name themselves. Some are mentioned four or five, and some are mentioned 40 or 50. And we take those opinion leaders who are, who are named by 40 or 50, and they help guide, give feedback to, and encourage others throughout the entire intervention. And I've done this in organizations of as many as 100,000 people, and it has a huge impact. I'll jump to source six. Source six looks at the, wor the physical world as it enables us, the influence of space or data or cues, tools, processes, and other environmental factors. We are not good at this. We are intuitively good psychologists. We are mediocre social psychologists, and we are horrible organizational theorists. This is source six. So co-op owners in England clashed with gang members who were painting graffiti on their shops. You may have read this in the news. If you know the answer, you can't shout it out. I have to guess it. What could they do beyond threats and police? What could they do in terms of, t of using things to get people to change their behavior? Anyone have a guess? Art they have a contest. That might be interesting. Have an art contest. Yes. In South America, they have a law that you have to have art when you go leave. They could have something like that. But like promotional art. So if it's a bakery, have like hamburger buns. Yeah. <laughs> get your buns in here. Yeah. Don't you love the double entendre? That's a <laughs> Ooh, I should take up advertising. <laughs> Co-owners pipe classical music through speakers in front of the store. Owners report that most effective musical deterrents are anything written by Mozart or sung by Pavarotti. <laughs> now, remember I argued earlier that this isn't an issue of one right answer. What you're suggesting may be helpful. I'm suggesting you have to overwhelm overwhelming problems by giving several sources. This is a physical source that no one would ever have dreamed of. Play classical music, and somehow they feel like they don't want to do graffiti. <laughs> So let me, let's, I'm not going to play this game. I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to do one. Here's the, here's the punchline. Those who use four or more sources of influence to change personal habits are four times likely to succeed. With organizational, if you use four or more, you're 10 times more likely to succeed. 10 times. So when I walk into an organization, and they say we're trying to improve safety, and I say, what are you doing? They're saying we're writing a memo, we're giving a speech. What am I going to tell them? Insufficient. You have the perfectly organized world here. You've got peer pressure. You've got physicality. You've got policies and procedures. You've got dozens of things creating the, your, your current safety level. We often call it your culture, the shared values and assumptions of the workforce. You're going to have to do it four or more, and you now have a way of thinking about six different places to turn. So going back to our nosocomial infection, we actually tried to see if this would actually work with one final study, then I'll open up for QA. What you're about to see is real. Real kids doing real things. Just thought you should know. My name's Hiram Gray, and I was there for the whole thing. So here's a question. What does it take to get people to change? And I'm not talking about their socks and underwear, but change behavior, especially when it's hard. For example, Every year, close to 100,000 people die from hospital-acquired infections. That means people got sick at the hospital. And it turns out one of the main culprits is hand hygiene. That means just getting people to wash their hands could save lives. So my crack research team decided to conduct an experiment to see if we could change something as difficult as hand washing habits, only with the toughest subjects of all kids. So here's what we did. We took 80 munchkins and put them into groups. First, we gave them a challenging puzzle to put together. You know, kind of like the projects you adults are always busy with. Then, we gave the kids a tempting distraction. I'll raise my flag, just like this, and then I'll blow my whistle. 
Okay, and when I do that, you guys can all go and get your cupcake. So what would it take to get these kids to wash their hands? How about a good reason? So one thing you guys should know, there was a sick kid in here playing with the puzzle pieces. He had a runny nose and coughed a lot, so there's probably a lot of germs on everything. But there's hand sanitizer over there on the table that you can use to wash up. Okay, which will win out? Delicious frosted cupcakes or the fear of a typhoid talk? <laughs> Let's watch. They finished their task, and look, if the threat of one sick kid wasn't enough, just look at all the new jokes popping. to wash? What do you think they'll do? <laughs> okay, so that was a colossal failure. Now what? Well, at this point, most adults would quit. That's why you just keep changing the year on those New Year's resolutions. <laughs> yes, kids, I changed the environment by moving the hand sanitizer closer. That's source then six. put up a visual cue. This ought to make hand washing easier and more obvious, right? And... <laughs> <laughs> the motivation to not get sick plus changing the environment didn't influence a single kid. Yikes! Next, I increased their ability, which is another source of influence. I had them all complete what is known as deliberate practice, or training, to increase their familiarity with good hand hygiene. Will adding another source of influence get these hand washing offenders to wash up? And well, now we're seeing some better results. We're combining three different sources of influence, and some of the kids are actually washing their hands. It looks like we're on the right track. So next, I added another source of influence, social influence. What if somebody spoke up and said something? What would happen if their bosses were in the room with them? Here come the cupcakes. And there goes the flag. Will they wash? No! Look at them pouncing on those cupcakes like a pack of ravenous hyenas. But it's not too late, because something important happens. At just the critical moment, a peer, not even one of the bosses, speaks up. Wash your hands. Watch the effect. <laughs> Success at last! <laughs> so social motivation obviously made a difference. But was it the only thing that mattered? What about our other sources of influence? Here's what my kids had to say. I was walking over to get my cupcake, but then someone said, wash my your hands. Because this boy had his nipples. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. We're currently, we just shot this a month ago, edited it two weeks ago. Uh, Johns Hopkins is now using this to generate conversations in all of their areas uh, where they then brainstorm by source. So a lot of doctors now, after they've washed, them, washed their hands and been around a little bit and say they're still clean, you haven't put their hand in blood auger. And then, the, then you grow all the diseases that are actually on their hands. 
Then, take, then they take the, these, a picture of these and bring them back, and then they put it on their computer to remind themselves. The point here is the one that he summarized very quickly, as I suggested earlier. One of our most important tasks in life is influencing others. Here in a leadership center, it's sort of the central task. Having a way of thinking about why people are doing what they're doing, I'm telling you right now, the world's perfectly organized to generate whatever behavior, good or bad, you're currently getting. You have to affect that world. You can't be blind to those forces. You have to identify and then work on those. In the book, our, web, our website, and other places, you can go and learn of dozens of different strategies source by source. Anyway, so there we go. We've got five, four and a half minutes left for questions. Let's go to questions. Okay, this is the point where you say, do I raise my hand and keep people away from the food? Looks like no questions. Therefore, let's go have food. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>